worship team. We just sung about the reign of God. And it is true that God reigns. But sometimes we forget that. And sometimes it doesn't feel like that. This is Memorial Day weekend, a time in our country when we set aside this weekend to remember those who sacrificed their lives for the freedoms we have in America. It's a good thing to be patriotic. It's a good thing to give thanks and remember those who sac made the ultimate sacrifice. But as followers of Jesus, we know that our true freedom lies not in our country, but in our Savior. And his sacrifice on the cross is where freedom really comes from. So while we remember this Memorial Day, those who paid the price for our relative freedom as citizens of this country, we worship the one who gave his life for our ultimate freedom on the cross. Last weekend, we looked at Romans 8, where Paul talks about the groaning of creation and our groaning over the brokenness of the world. In a moment, Pastor Joe's going to come and preach to us, and uh, I love his, he's a remarkable, uh, gifted young preacher. You're going to be blessed by what he has to share. But before he comes, I just want to mention that that groaning that we talked about last week over things gone wrong and the ache we have that it should be different than it is. We didn't need another example of that, but we got one this week in Uvalde, Texas, with 19 children and two adults shot and killed. And I don't know about you, but I feel sometimes I'm caught between two temptations. One is that I, I, I want to give in to despair because it's just so awful and heartbreaking and, and hard to get your head around. And the other is to just think about something else. Ignore it. Focus my mind on something that's a little happier. But the gospel calls us to neither of those extremes. As followers of Jesus, we stare in the face the darkness of the world and don't give in to despair. So we neither ignore it nor do we collapse because of it. We seek God in the midst of it. And I saw online this week somebody posting, you know, that um, we're tired of just prayers. Prayers aren't making a difference. And I understand the desperate need for action and the debate about what that action should be. But let me just say, as people of, of, of the King who follow Jesus, prayer is our first and best response always. Jesus said, my house will be a house of prayer. So let me lead us in a moment of prayer of lament, of sorrow, and of seeking his grace and favor in the midst of darkness. Let's pray. Father, you know our groans, and we do groan. We groan when we think about children's lives cut short in an awful act of violence and hatred and sin and evil. We groan over the brokenness of our nation where this seems to keep happening. We groan over the teachers, powerless to defend their students, we groan over a community reeling from this awful tragedy. We pray, Lord, cry out to you for mercy, for healing, for hope, that you somehow, because of your goodness, would bring many people to trust in you in the midst of this darkness. And you bring comfort to those who are facing despair. And not only groaning over things happening far away, but we groan over the sin in our own hearts, of our own complacency, of our own brokenness and despair. Lord, you hear our groans. You know them all, and you're present with us in them. And in the midst of our groaning, Lord, we cry out to you knowing that you're the only one we can turn to. Our nation, our world, our families, our church, we are in desperate need of your grace. So we cry out to you for it, knowing that you freely give it. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer we trust and believe because you've told us so that you do hear and you do answer. Even when we don't see you are at work, even when we cannot see your hand, teach us to trust your heart. Thank you for hearing us. We pray in your name, Jesus. Amen.
Well, thank you, Pastor Jeff, for leading us in that way. It's good, isn't it, to spend some time together as a church family, to gather, to worship, and to open up his word. As we do so now, let me just add my welcome. My name is Joe Scavato. I'm one of the pastors here at Chapel Street. Those of you here at Kesslinger, those of you watching online, we're, we're so glad that we have this opportunity together. As we begin our time, I, I have a question for you. Um, I have a question. Is there something in your life, something that you enjoy doing, even though you are not very good at it? Is there something that's true of you that, that you will spend time doing this? Some of you, this was true of you uh, yesterday morning, where you woke up early and you drove to a golf course. And you paid money to be angry for four and a half hours. And then after those four and a half hours, you turned to your friends and you said, when are we going to do this again? This was great. Maybe for you it's golf, maybe it's a different hobby. For me, um, the thing that I enjoy doing that I am terrible at is uh, solving jigsaw puzzles. In fact, I I brought a couple with me here. Um, I'm not sure if you can see this in the back, but this is my speed of puzzle. Uh, This is a 60-piecer, and I actually got this from one of the preschool rooms here at the church, so that's kind of the level that I'm at um, intellectually. And it says age four and up, so that's a good place to be as a 30-year-old man with a college degree. Um, And the problem with that is that my wife, Judy, um, her speed is is something like this, where it's a thousand pieces. Um, And so we will do these together. We'll spend time, we'll spend an hour working on one of these thousand piece puzzles. And I will get in that time, maybe like a little like corner right here and she'll have everything else done. And it makes me so mad. I'm like golf course level mad at this point, but I just can't stop, it's great. All this to say, uh, we have a seven-month-old son. I have maybe like two or three years until I'm the worst puzzler in our family. So looking forward to that day. We've been in the series uh, recently called The Greatest Chapter these past couple of weeks, looking at at Romans chapter 8, this beautiful chapter written by the Apostle Paul that, that talks about what the life of a follower of Jesus looks like. And it's filled with all of this encouragement and instruction and guidance. And we've seen these things, if you've been with us in these past couple of weeks, that when we are in Christ, that we are no longer condemned. We've been given the spirit of God that lives with us, that we are children of God, that we are heirs with Christ. And then last week, as Pastor Jeff just mentioned, we we saw this, that as followers of Jesus, that we are people that live in tension every single day. That we live in this tension where we look at the brokenness of the world, where we look at the brokenness of our own lives when we look out and we see one tragedy after another, where we see the situations and families in, in Texas and in Buffalo and in Chicago and in California and all over that are forever changed by one tragedy that we see after another. We see this, that we are people that groan, that this should not be, that things should be different. And yet in that, we are also people of profound hope. And we have been given this hope, hope not in our own abilities or our own achievements, but hope that is in Jesus and what he has done on our behalf. Hope This is what we're gonna be looking at today, this hope that that Paul will continue uh, looking at, the hope that our lives are not defined by suffering without purpose, but hope that God is working together all things for good. Uh, Just like this, he he takes the pieces of our lives, things that don't make sense, things that, that seems unclear and confusing, and he makes something good and beautiful out of it. This is what we're gonna be looking at today. If you have a Bible with you, turn to Romans chapter eight with me. Um, We're gonna be looking, starting at verse 26. And we're gonna see here three different sources of hope. Three truths that we can hold on to in the midst of difficult times. So let's read together verse 26 and verse 27. It says, likewise, the spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. This is our first hope. We see here, we see this Spirit's prayer. 
with Spirit's prayer. Um, recently, Judy and I, we were having a conversation about the five love languages. Some of you know what those are, the different ways that we can receive and show uh, love. And I don't know if any of you uh, feel this way, but, and this is probably my fault more than it is hers, but, but oftentimes we find ourselves where my wife wants to have these deep conversations with me at the exact moment that I least want to have them. Anybody else experienced that? Um, we, we learned this shortly after we got married where we realized that she is a morning talker and I am not a morning talker. And so we would wake up and immediately she would wanna know like everything about my childhood and I just wanted coffee. Uh, so we had to figure that out. Uh, but this time we were talking about love languages and it was late at night, so I was kind of tired. Um, I was watching TV, the, the NBA playoffs are going on. I, I was watching the game and, and I was also hungry. And every commercial break, there was this commercial for a, a new chicken sandwich, and I really wanted one. It looked good. And so she's trying to have this conversation with me. She's really kind of doing both sides of the conversation. And, and she told me that she thinks that my love language is being understood. In other words, that I feel love the most when she knows what I'm thinking. And by the way, that's not on the list, so she's kind of cheating. Um, but she told me that, that it's being understood. So I said, okay, what am I thinking? And she said, well, you're probably thinking that you don't wanna have this conversation because you're probably tired and you're watching the game and you're probably thinking about food. She went three for three. So I think we need to add a sixth love language. I think she's onto something. Being understood, that's a good one. It's true, I think, of all of us. Isn't that true of you? Doesn't it matter? Doesn't it, it change how you feel when someone just gets you? when they know what makes you tick, when they know how you feel and what you're gonna say, not just when you're tired or, or hungry, but, but at the core of who you are? Isn't that something that we all long for in our lives? This is what we see here. This is what we see that the Spirit does on our behalf. Look again at verse 26. We see two things that the Holy Spirit does in our lives. He helps us and he intercedes for us. It says this, that he helps us in our weakness. Just as Jesus promised that he would in John chapter 14, when he says that the Father will send a helper to teach you all things. That as followers of Jesus, we are never alone. That the Spirit of God is at work in your life, even now, in this moment. Psalm 46 puts it this way. It says that God is our refuge and strength in ever-present help in trouble. He helps us. He also intercedes for us. Look again at verse 26. We see that in response to creation's groaning and our groaning at the brokenness that we see, that the Spirit responds with groaning of his own. There's a lot of groaning in this chapter. But this is what we see here, that the Spirit knows you so well, that even without you saying a word, if you've ever been in a situation where, where things are just so dark that you don't even know what to say, that you don't even have words, you go to, to pray and there's just nothing, that the Spirit sees you, He hears you, and He knows exactly what you're going through. He sees this and he takes it to the Father and he voices your pain. He intercedes, petitions, prays for you. I mentioned this earlier uh, that Judy and I are, are recent parents. In fact, I brought a picture of our son with me. Um, you can see that he's already like a million times cooler than I am. And so, uh, but he's about seven months old now and we've loved getting to know him. And, and one of the things that we've learned as parents, maybe those of you that are, are parents will know what I'm talking about, uh, but we've learned that he has different cries for different situations. We've learned that, that he has a certain cry when he's tired and it's a very different one when he's hungry. It's very helpful. I think we as adults need to do something like this because it makes things much easier. But this is what the Holy Spirit does for you. He hears your cry and because he knows you, he also knows what it is that you need. What a gift this is. How many of us right now in this moment have a cry in your heart? How many of you have a, a desire, a longing, something in your life that just seems broken beyond repair? How many of us know what it is to suffer, to have something happen, to have a, a loss or a grief that, that words have no equal for? And you've gone to pray and there's just nothing to say. 
what a gift this is if you know today what it is to suffer. That right now, in this moment, that the Spirit of God understands you fully. He knows what you're going through, and right now, he is bringing your name, your life, your situation to the Father. This is the hope that we've been given, a hope not just of empathy, but also of advocacy. That the Spirit not just lends you his ear, but also stands in your corner. What a gift. We see this then in verse 27. Look, look at this because this is crucial for us to see. That the Spirit prays according to the will of God. You see that? That the Spirit does not pray according to the will of Joe. He does not pray that everything I ask for, everything on my list happens in my timing. He does not pray to relieve my suffering just because I want him to. How does he pray? He prays as Jesus taught us to. Do you remember? Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So this is the question that all of this comes down to, a question that many of us struggle with when it comes to our prayer life. Do you believe that God knows and understands you or not? Do you believe that he knows you completely, that he, that he hears your cry and he knows what it is that you need? And that maybe he even knows you better than you know yourself. Do you believe that today? This is what maturing faith looks like. It completely changes the purpose of prayer where no longer is prayer simply about getting my way, but about finding God's will about saying, God, here are the things that I want, here are the desires of my heart, and it is good to do so. He longs for us to do that. But we say, God, this is what I want, but more important, what do you want for me? Because I know, even if I don't see it, I know that it is better. This is really challenging. This is really difficult to do, isn't it? Here's the good news, that while we figure all this out, the Spirit is already doing it on our behalf. This is the Spirit's prayer. Next we see the Father's promise. The Father's promise. Um, I remember back when I was learning how to drive, uh, the day that my dad took me to drive on the highway for the first time. And I have a, just a clear memory of this. We were merging onto I-88, um, and as we were merging, he said, step on it like we were in like an action movie. Um, and so I said, okay. And so that pedal hit the floor and you have never seen a Buick Century move so fast. Like we were flying. <laughs> and I remember feeling like this, like we were going so fast and I looked and I think I looked at, you know, how fast we we're going and it was like 50 miles an hour. <laughs> Which if you've ever been on 88, that's like 20. Um, and I just remember just everything happening so fast and cars are just flying by us and people are not happy because I'm going 50 and they are mad about that. Uh, and so I just remember like he was trying to teach me how to drive and you know, use your mirrors and change lanes and all of this stuff. And I was like, nope. And my eyes just went forward at the car in front of us and they just did not move. And it got to the point where he literally had to turn in his seat to look behind him and he would tell me that when it was okay to turn. And so he would just yell out left and I would go left. And I would just trust that he knew what he was doing. Reading these verses, these, these words that we're going to read next reminded me of that day. You'll be familiar maybe with some of them. This is verse 28 and 29. It says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. In order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. What a beautiful promise this is, isn't it? What beautiful words. No wonder so many of us have heard these words before and held on to them and, and hoped that they were true. That if we are followers of Jesus, that we can know this. Not just that we blindly believe it or wish it were so, that we can know that God is taking all of the pieces of our lives and he is working something good, that he is building something, that he is working together all things. 
for good. This does not, by the way, mean that all things are good. I think sometimes, especially those of us in the church, we, we tend to fall into this trap every once in a while where, where we are convinced that somehow we have to be okay. And so maybe you've done this, maybe you even did it today where you've gone to church before and someone says, hey, how are you? And you say, all good. And meanwhile, you're struggling with your job or your kids aren't doing great or you know, things are not are good. But, but that's just what we have to say, isn't it? Sometimes we'll be asked how we're doing and we, we'll say, well, I'm here. And that's kind of like a cry for help sometimes. Can I ask you a question? Now, obviously, we can't share our life story with everybody that asks how we're doing. We'd, we'd never leave here. But can I ask you a question? Do you have someone in your life that you can be not all good around? Are there people in your life, people that will ask you the hard questions, people that know you, people that you have the freedom to be not okay with? Can I be honest with you? That in the three plus years that I've been here at Chapel Street, that one of the biggest blessings in our lives has been our life group. Having a a small group of people to go through life together with that know when we are not all good, that have been there with us in some of the lowest moments of our lives, that point us to the truth that we see in this verse, that even when we don't see it, that they can be our encouragement that God is still at work in our midst. Do you have that? Do you have someone that you can be not all good around? Many of you are familiar with um, the story of Old Testament Joseph. I I think we'll actually be looking at more of his story as part of our summer series. Uh, But much of Joseph's life was defined by suffering. If you're not familiar with his story or you haven't seen his musical, um, his story, basically, he was uh, sold into slavery by his brothers, he was imprisoned by his owner, and then he was betrayed by his fellow prisoners. And yet somehow, God showed up in his life, and through this incredible set of circumstances, he was put into a position of authority that he would save many lives, including the lives of those who betrayed him. And so we see this at the end of his life. Joseph is talking to his brothers. And in Genesis chapter 50, we see this thing that he says. He says, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. What you meant for evil, God meant for good. Now, don't get tripped up on this. This does not say that God causes evil, that he does evil for good. He's not ruining our lives to teach us a lesson. I think sometimes we get that picture of God and that is not the God of scripture. Rather, we have a God that is in the redemption business. A God that takes every part of our lives, everything the enemy throws our way, every bit of brokenness that comes from living in a fallen world. And he takes what was meant for evil and he uses it for good. This is what we see that faith is not simply blindly believing that that everything happens for a reason, but rather the knowledge that God has the ability to bring reason, bring purpose, bring redemption, bring hope out of everything. All things work together for good. Here's the question then, the question that really matters if that's true. What is good? How does God define good? What is the picture on the box that he's taking all of our broken pieces and what is he trying to assemble? Luckily, Paul tells us, we see this in verse 29. Read this with me, it says in verse 29, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. This is God's definition of good, that we would be conformed to the image of his son. Do you see that? That God's definition of good has very little to do with our comfort and everything to do with our conforming to become more like Christ. This is God's ultimate goal for your life and for mine 
This is the picture he is working to create. This is what his redemption is working towards. Not just that we would be happy, but that we would be holy. This is so important. I think for many of us, the frustrations that we have stems from the fact that maybe our picture of what God is doing is a little bit too small. I think sometimes we we think of it as, as something that we can solve on our own, something that we can see the entirety of, something that is based in our life and our experience. And what God is saying here is that there is so much more going on than the little corner that you've been able to work out. There's so much more that I am doing. Do you have the faith, the trust, the the belief in me to believe that I can see the entire road? That when I tell you to turn, you can trust that I know what I'm doing. One thing I think the world has taught us in the last couple of years is that none of us have as much figured out as maybe we thought that we did. None of us have all the answers to all of the questions. We're all trying to figure things out, and this is the hope that those of us who follow Jesus have been given. That if you have Jesus, then that is okay. We don't have to know what's ahead of us all the time. We don't have to have everything solved because we have a God that is big enough, that is smart enough, that is powerful enough, a God that sees the whole road and directs our steps, a God that sees all of the pieces and knows where they go. He specializes in redemption. He takes what the enemy means for evil and he says, I will bring good out of this, even if no one else can. I think this is what maturing and growing faith looks like and what it declares. That even if I have things that I long for in my life, and we all do, even if you have that hope for your life, if, if you hope that your family stays healthy or you hope that you find a spouse or you hope that you achieve your goals in your career, whatever your hope is, that we might declare that even if none of that happens, that still we believe that God is doing something better. Still we believe that we will see the picture that he is trying to create. Still we believe that whether it's in this life or the next, we will see God's goodness for us. This is the Father's promise. Finally, we see the Son's path. Let's finish this section up together. Verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Now there is a lot here that we could talk about. There's so much theology and depth in just two verses. But as we look at this, remember again what Paul is doing. Remember that he is giving hope and reassuring people that in the midst of their suffering, that nothing can separate them from the love of God. This is what we're gonna look at next week as we finish up this series. It's kind of like, um, I remember the first time I took an Uber. Uh, Do you remember if you've done that before? I remember it being kind of a weird thing for me and I was very hesitant about it because my whole life I was told to not get in strangers' cars. And now I was paying someone that I didn't know to drive me around. So it felt very strange, and I remember getting in the car, and I pulled the map up as he was driving, and I was like following everything he was doing. Like, you're going to turn right, okay? And he turned right, okay, I'm not going to get kidnapped, we're good. It was very stressful, um, but I remember just being so concerned that I was going to get on the wrong path, and I think that's what Paul is doing here. He's saying, oftentimes when we suffer, when we experience darkness or confusion, it's easy to think that maybe we're not on the right path, that that maybe we've done something wrong or, or God is not with us anymore. And here Paul says that none of that is true, that even as we suffer, that God is doing something, that he has been doing something since long before we were born and he will continue to work good, to bring redemption forever. This is what we see here. He shows us five things that God is doing. We see the first two in verse 29, that he foreknew us and those he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed into the image of Christ. Now, those of us that are uh, theology nerds, your ears perked up a little when I read those words, didn't they? When we looked at these words, foreknew and predestined, 
Some of you know this, but there's been just so much debate for centuries about what these words mean, about what it means to be foreknown. This is Old Testament language that that Paul uses that talks about uh, how God would uh, speak to the nation of Israel. It's this idea of having this knowledge that is more personal than it is intellectual. That before we were even born, that God knew us and loved us. And then what it means to be predestined, literally to be predetermined, to have boundaries set around us. Again, we could spend so much time talking about what this means and different theories and different ideas, but, but in summary, there are basically two ends of the spectrum of what this might mean. On one end, there's what's known as the Arminian belief that, that God foreknew us, that he knew who would follow him out of their own free will. And then on the other end, the, the Calvinist belief that God not just knew who would follow him, but that he produces the very desire of that will in certain people to make that happen. So in other words, it's the difference between I gave my life to Christ and God got a hold of me and never let go. To both of those sentences, I would say yes. Yes, that, that God produces all good desires that, he, that we love because he first loved us and that he loves us too much to force us into anything. Now, there's much smarter people than me that we could go much more in depth with, but, but here's what matters for our purposes today. Here's what matters, that if you are following Jesus, that you have been known and loved since before you were born, that God looks at you as a son or a daughter. And as a family member, he has a plan for your life, a purpose that you have been given that nothing can separate you from. What is that purpose? to become more like Jesus. This is his goal for your life. This is what he's working all things towards. Nothing the world can throw at you changes that. This leads us to the next two things. Look at verse 30 with me. We see that we are called, that we are invited, that, we, uh, that Jesus stands at the door and knocks, as it says in Revelation chapter three, that, he would, that we would open the door to welcome him in and then those that accept that invitation are justified, that we have been made clean. This is what Paul has been talking about this entire chapter. Remember what he says in Romans 8, verse two. He says that the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. This is true of you right now, today, if you are a follower of Christ, that you are no longer condemned, that he sees you as a child, and not as an enemy, but he invites you into this life. And then finally, we see that we are glorified. Do you remember the way that, that Paul started this section, this, this thought that, that, we're see, that we've been looking at in the last couple of weeks? Go back with me to verse 18. He says that I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. No amount of suffering compares to glory. Do you see that? Do you see what he's doing? That he, he starts and ends with glory. And in doing so, he's showing us how to deal with the suffering of our present time. That we begin and end with glory. Glory, this word being weighty or, or valuable, teaching us how God looks at us right now that he views us not as a a disappointment or a screw up, but as something worth cherishing and protecting. That we are in the process of being glorified, that as we become more like Jesus, that more of God's glory shows in this world. This is the process that we are on as followers of Christ. And yet this is the hope that we leave with today. That all of the glory that we can see here in this life is just the beginning that if you are a follower of Jesus, that ultimate glory is coming one day and soon. That there will be a day when you receive a new body that is healed and whole. That there will be a day when you receive a new home with an eternal family that will be filled with harmony and peace. That there will be a day when the suffering and the darkness and the confusion of your life is gone. 
where you're able to look at your life and look at what God has done and you're able to see the goodness that he has worked, the beauty of your life. But he has worked all things for good. This is the glory that is ahead of you, where we will be able to look back and we will be able to celebrate and worship him for the goodness in our lives. This is what's promised to you and to me, to live today in the hope of that glory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, we we thank you for today. We thank you for the hope that, that we are given in your word, for the promise that all things work together for good. Father, I pray today for those that know what it is to suffer. Lord, would you remind them that the Spirit intercedes on our behalf. Lord, that you know what we're going through. Lord, that you are working redemption even when we don't see how that could even be possible. And Lord, that we have glory to look forward to in this life and ultimately in the next. Thank you for showing up in our lives. Thank you for the hope that we have been given. We love you and we pray this in your name, amen. Amen. Again, we're so glad that you could join us today. If we could be praying for you, anything going on in your life, our prayer team is out in the glass room after the service. We'd love to do that, it would be an honor. Now receive today's benediction. May you go now in the name of Jesus Christ, the one who is making all things good. Go in the hope of redemption, the hope of glory that you have been given. Amen.